This is Ashton Henderson, Deputy Athletic Director for Championship Resources and Culture at Michigan State University, and welcome to the One Question Leadership Podcast. I'm grateful to be an advocate for the diversity of the programming that the NCAA Leadership Development Team puts together. They help me immensely in a variety of different ways, particularly as a proud graduate of the Dr. Charles Whitcomb Leadership Institute. This program is a two-year immersive and expansive, introspective way to really find and help leaders like myself shape the experiences of what we want to see for tomorrow and the leaders of intercollegiate athletics and the future of how we see ourselves. I'm grateful for that experience because it truly helped me understand and define who I am as a leader and helped me shape and build what I go by and what I live by each and every day, which is the three C model of culture, communication, and connectivity. Without that program, those three things don't exist so that I continue to uplift, shape, and make this universe as well as its ecosystem effective because of the work that they do. Enjoy the episode. Greetings, this is Ty Brown, and welcome to the One Question Leadership Podcast, where we highlight executive and organizational leadership. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at one Q leadership. I am joined by Raymond Harrison. Raymond is the Senior Associate Athletics Director for Student Development and Performance at North Carolina State University. Greetings, Raymond. Thanks for joining us. Ty, good afternoon, sir. It's good to see you. Good to be on this podcast. Yes, sir. Um, for the first time, I think. <laughs> for the first time but good to see you yeah glad to have you on one thing you and i have a have in common is a healthy appreciation for core values and what they mean in terms of uh leading your life i'll give you a definition that i use for core values core values are a list of preferred attributes that an individual or organization uses to guide behavior and decisions right Talk to me a little bit about that in terms of you and core values. I know you've done some work with uh, leadership development. Um, I'm pretty sure you've done some work before that in terms of establishing what your core values are. But tell me, have any of those, they, they don't change. You don't want them really to change often, but has anything changed your lens in terms of core values and what those are and how they've been unveiled to you or revealed to you through the years? Yeah, I think. Um, the first time I was really introduced to core values was uh, several years ago. Um, had a former AD that I worked with, a mentor of mine, Eric Hyman. Eric was big on core values, and so he's the first one that really introduced me to it. And so I started to formulate my core values uh, back when, and they've they've changed over time. They've not uh, shifted a whole lot, but you know, having a family, uh, making sure that. Yeah. Uh, I continue to evolve. There are some things I've had to adjust with my values, but they they virtually stay close to what they are. Those things that are important to me. But I think it's it's my core values, um, which is important for me to know, because it helps me understand what type of organization, what type of leader uh, would be a best fit for me. Right. And so you always want to find organizations that align with your values. Uh, whether it's the the organization and also the leader that you serve under. Right. So now, how long you been there, North Carolina State? Eight years now. Eight years. So North Carolina State, you you've been through a couple athletics directors, and you think about the change of someone coming in, who comes in with their own core values, and will probably look at the department and decide if the current trajectory is the same trajectory that they want to be on. Purpose won't change enhance the academic mission of the university, but those core values, foundational principles may adjust a little bit. So, so talk to me about that in that, that was a few years ago now, but in that change, uh, transition of athletic director, and now you're wondering, do my values fit with the new person that's coming in? Yeah, Ty, that's, that's really, it's an interesting dynamic because I remember um, interviewing for the job at NC State with, uh, with our previous AD at the time, Debbie Yao, mm -hmm. And, and I remember having a chance to talk to her about my values, call, talking to her about hers. Um, and then I had a chance to, you know, really assess, would this be a good fit for me? Um, when my new when my new boss came in, I didn't have the luxury of of interviewing him, so to speak, and, and being able to determine if those aligned. Uh, but I'll tell you what, uh, I can tell you right now what those core values are. Uh, trust, accountability, passion, empathy, and raise your hand. 
and you hear those and right away I'm like, yep, those align with with mine. But I think it's one thing to hear those values. It's another to see and to feel those values live out, be lived out every day. Because I think it's it's important that we we can put core values and values on paper. Those values don't mean anything unless they're lived unless out in an everyday, you know, in an everyday environment. 100%. And so that's what I've seen. Yeah, that's interesting. It, over the last few years, as I've further developed and articulated my values, I, I watched a couple of people and how they can just drop them at a hat like you just did for uh, Corgan. Uh, Brian Blair, Randall Richmond, they tend to, they can just, it's nothing for them, right? Bullet points, right? So so I what I did was come up with mine and I sent them out to a bunch of people. And their response was like, yeah, I don't know why it took you so long to write these out because you've been doing this for so long. So to your point, when somebody's living their values, right, it's not just written down on a piece of paper. You can actually see it. And and I lean in. One of mine is curiosity, right? And so I lean in to podcasts and the video to interviewing people, making people think by asking questions. I wonder which one of the values that you have, and I don't think you named yours, but which one of the values you have you lean into that you've been since the la in the last year, eight years at North Carolina State? The one that I've leaned in the most has been family. Okay. Uh, a lot of folks question when I moved from Texas A&M to NC State, um, people look at different jobs from different lenses and I understand it. I was leaving the SEC to go to the a ACC. Um, but one of the one of the main parts of the currency in taking that job, um, it put me closer to family. It put my wife an hour and a half away from home. It, it put us up the road from my mom. It put us up the road from my brother-in-law. And so that piece of family was extremely important and there's no way to put a dollar value on that. And so that, that for me, that value, um, if that's important to me, then it has to weigh heavily in the decision that we make. And that's the decision that we made to go because largely because of our family being yeah. there. You talk about evaluating decisions, right? With that specific core value, like when you're making decisions at work, right? Cause I always wonder about professional values and personal values obviously some of them have to overlap but are are they the same like making opportunities to bring somebody on at work or uh, opportunities to make a big decision at work that may affect your professional career or something because i've done this and we accomplished this or something like that do you use the same values to evaluate work decisions too I mean, I guess family could be a couple layers away, but I don't, you know. Well, I, I think, I think again, you have to have alignment with your personal values, but the, the, the values of the organization are really the ones that you, in my opinion, you should be using okay. to make the decisions. In the workplace. Because those are the guiding principles for us. Yeah. And so every decision that I have to make has to be aligned with, with that trust, accountability, passion, empathy, um, how we take care of our people. Um ultimately how we take care of our student athletes. Are yeah. we always doing what's in the best interest of our students? And I see, I think you do it that way. And I think your personal core values for me, I lean on those to make sure that I'm staying in, that I'm staying centered yeah. and I'm, and I'm walking in the, in the path in a way that I need to walk in order to really take care of people and then make sure that I'm also doing it in a way. I'll give you an example. Um, patience is one for me, right? And, and patience for me is is typically how am I getting myself in order every morning so that I can show up in the right way for our team, Okay. right? And so there are times throughout the day I have to pause. Sometimes I have to check in and see where am I emotionally? Because if I've got something that I got to make a big decision on, especially if it's a personnel decision, I don't ever need to make those out of emotion. So I always have to check and make sure and check in with myself to make sure that I'm in the best place, centered, patient, pausing so that I'm making the right decision that could affect someone's life, um, that could affect someone's livelihood. Okay. Yeah. I think that's excellent. A lot of these things I've learned, I learned at a time when I used to volunteer with Dutch Balk, right? Who I think we both know. Yeah. Uh, mentored, Love Dutch. Mentored uh, Eric Hyman that you worked Absolutely. for at uh, Texas A&M. And Dutch told me one day I was at American Football Coaches Association and I was trying to figure out a purpose of the department I was leading. I was over uh, education. I was director of education. And so I put some words down and Dutch was like, look, the word, it, it needs to be a simply stated sentence, right? <laughs> in terms of purpose and, 
in what you're doing so that everything you do, you can measure against the purpose. Are we, is this decision helping us execute our purpose, right? Then you went into core competence. Then I went into core values and all those things. So Dutch helped me do that and helped me find the right words to be able to handle something like that. And I wonder about, I'm going to make an assumption here is that you mentor people in the industry, right? Even yes. the student athletes you work with, yeah, absolutely. But, but, but people I think outside that's part of, of it, yeah, yeah, people outside of North Carolina State. I wonder about helping people find their center so that they can stay centered as they grow in the sure. industry. Tell me about that aspect of what you do. Wow, Ty. Um, purpose, right? Yeah. I think I think you you can call it purpose. You can call it why. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes people label it mission, vision, whatever however you want to um, do. It. Exactly. But 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 essentially, why do we do what we do? Uh, what's the passion behind what we do? And and I really I think it's so important for us to understand and hold tightly to whatever that why or that purpose is because um, I, I think about that as the foundation. Mm -hmm. And and what's happening? What's always going to happen? There are going to be choppy waters. There are going to be things that occur that are out of our control that we sometimes just can't anticipate. But for us, it's always going to be important that you get back to that anchor. You, you, you want to hold on to that because I think that's the thing that will allow you to stick with it. Because sometimes we just need to stick with stuff. And that's one of the biggest pieces of advice that I give to anyone I'm working with is why do you do what you do? Tell me why. Tell me a little bit about you that leads to why you do this. Cause I don't, I don't necessarily need to read your resume and know all the things you've done. Simply tell me what is it about you that has put you in this position to do this job? Because I, I honestly, um, I, I think we have to hire people that are highly competent and experienced, yes, sir. but I like to find people that have a heart for the work, a heart for the people, because those are things you can't teach. Um, we've talked about this before. Um, Eric Hyman said something to me I'll never forget. He said, you don't, you don't teach values, you hire values. Right. And so I think it's so important that we try to find a way to help people really understand, like, what is your heart? Why do you do this? Because if you know what that is, that that's always going to be a guiding light for yeah. you. Yeah, I agree with that. It's, it's interesting. You don't teach values, you hire values. I, the work I do now is help people reveal what their core values are based on their experiences and then articulate in their story in terms of who you are in the context of what you do, right? And I think that's important. The values are who I am and then what I do with my career and how I have the values showed up in my career. I go back to what Dutch was telling me, purpose was a simply worded statement explaining why you exist and took that, created that for the AFCA. And about a year later, I started thinking, well, why do I exist? What's my, what's my physical purpose, right? Spiritually, you know, who, where are you? We don't really know what that is, right? But physically, so I came up with it. You come up with that to be a resource to my family, close friends and community. And then you start executing on that. And then over time you get to the core values and you start executing on those. And I say all that to say, what happens if you're interviewing someone who hasn't done the work to reveal what their values are, but you, don't teach values, you got to hire values, right? Tell me how that shows up. Cause I mean, I can imagine you can see in the work they've done or something like that, but. Yeah, it, it's not a, it's not an exact science. Yeah, right, exactly. And, and some people may not be able to articulate okay. their, their, you talked about Randall Richmond mm -hmm. and you talked about Brian Blair. Not everyone is going to be able to do it as like eloquently do. Right. and succinctly Other as those point, guys these, do, these, right? Yeah, exactly. But I think part of it for us is, you know, I've, I've mentioned that we've had to, I had to lead several um, searches to bring in yeah, you did. You said that multiple offline. leaders yep. over the last couple of years. And so one of the things is, you got to start with what are you looking for? What are those attributes? And in addition to those attributes, you always want to keep out in front. Well, who, what are our values? Mm -hmm. And you want to set up opportunities and questions and interactions to where the people who are part of our team that are interviewing, they're always looking for those values. Okay. Because yeah. if we, again, I can have someone who can really just hit it and say, hey, I know exactly these are my values and they line up with your values. Mm -hmm. But when I am when I have um, an intern who's taking you across campus and you let your guard down, 
and then you 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 don't really yeah. show a whole lot of integrity, mm-hmm. or you don't have you know you don't necessarily have the empathy that you're talking about. Yep. Like we're always watching for those things. Okay, and so I think that's what it the interview process has to be um, very intentional. Um, you you know when when someone is interviewing with the executive staff, I expect them to to be their best. If they're not the best during that time, then shame on them. But I want to see how do you interact with someone um, when you when you interact with one of our groundskeepers, when 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 like I said, an intern is taking you across campus. Your values are always being under purview, and so I'm, what we're doing is we're just asking our staff. At the end of the day, does this person model who we are? What we're looking for. What we're looking yeah, for. I think it's interesting. Again, you're right. And what I found in the work I've done, a lot of people haven't revealed and cannot articulate. But you're saying that how they live and how they work. You'll be able to see it. It's to show up. Yeah, I think that's excellent. I'll give you a quick story, and I want to know if 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 the if the underlying theme in the story has ever happened to you. So when I when I uh, when I was a freshman, I tried out for the football team at Michigan State and didn't make it. And I called home and said, "I am coming back home. I got accepted in the Arizona State. I'm a transfer. We're gonna make this thing happen. Or I was gonna go to a junior college back home in L.A." and try to earn a scholarship, we're gonna make this thing happen. My mother said, you need to talk to your father. Pops was dying of lung cancer, throat, c- c- cigarettes all his life. And got on the phone with me and he said, look, Ty, we didn't send you to school to get on the football team. We sent you to school to bring home a piece of paper. And what that did for me was help me delineate the difference between purpose and goals, right? The purpose for being at Michigan State was to get a degree. One of the goals I wanted to accomplish was to get on a team. No matter that I didn't get on a team initially, right? This still was a goal of mine. So I went back to school, tried out, got on a team, scholarship and all that kind of stuff. I say all that to say there are times in life where whatever we're trying to accomplish, we may not accomplish or we may accomplish it. But the process of going through whatever we're trying to do, we realize that we need to operate from a bigger lens. We need to have a wider perspective in terms of what we've been doing before. And that's what that did for me. When I didn't make the football team, I came back like, okay, okay, grades are important, right? I'm gonna I'm work out a little harder, but I'm also gonna spend a lot more time in school and in class because I have a purpose for why I'm be here. Being here in football was just a goal. It's a long way of asking you if you experienced anything like that, that you can talk about or that you can't talk about, right? In terms of, doing some work and realizing that, you know what, this has helped me see that there's a bigger picture in terms of what I'm working on here. So Tom, I'm gonna say this to you. Um, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you tell your story mm-hmm. and, and it immediately makes me think about a personal story of my own okay. that's very similar, mm-hmm. different, but yeah. similar. Um, I played football at the University of Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the unique things I share with people all the time is I played for two head coaches, five defensive coordinators, and five position yeah, coaches wow. in my five years. Yeah. And and one of the things, um, transitioning from one head coach to the other, um, the way I see it is now is totally different than how I saw it okay. then. I saw a new coach coming in who didn't care much about me, um, who wanted to get his guys in. And that was the lens in which I saw it from. And that's okay because that's my lens at yeah. that time. That's that's the level of context I have. Um, but what I learned when I look back and what I do now, uh, I tell people all the time, that was the worst, best experience of my life. Yeah. Because it, you, we talk about student athlete experience all the time. Mm-hmm. I did not have a great student athlete experience but I had a heck of an educational process okay. and a development process because I lived it. I saw a lot of my teammates not continue to remain in school. I saw a lot of those guys go back home without any hope. And I was irritated and agitated like no other, but at the time I didn't have the language. I couldn't really explain what was I going through. Right. I was just I was just upset. And I remember calling mom and dad and saying, I don't want to be here anymore. Mm-hmm. I want to leave. And I remember both of them saying, no, you're going to stay there. Mm-hmm. There, You didn't go there for football. <laughs> right. you're, first, you're the first in our family to go to school. Mm-hmm. There's some things in here that you're going to look back and understand later right. that these are things to help you. And when I look back, 
that agitation of seeing my teammates, I've always believed that this is a life and death. People say this is not whatever. This business, because we're dealing with people. And, and, and as a coach or as an administrator, we have, we have influence as leaders. We mm -hmm. have influence over young people. And so we have to handle that with care. Yeah, and we have to do it in a way that honors them. And, and that can be telling them the truth. And that, that doesn't mean that we have to be coddly with exactly. them, but we yeah. have to be honest and, you, and operate with integrity with them. Um, but I saw a lot of my teammates go home, right? And so from that point going forward, I've been committed to the student athlete experience. I've been committed to making sure that young people utilize this opportunity to get a better lot in life because that's what it afforded me. I stayed, I got two degrees, mm -hmm. and here I am. And so one of the things I've learned about life is you you live it going forward, but many times you understand it looking backward. Yeah. And sometimes we go through stuff and we realize, well, woe is me and these people are unfair to me. And then but what's really happening is I'm being we're being trained yeah. to be able to help people along the way. Right. That's what that is for me. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think it's actually I also left with two degrees too, right, from Michigan State. Say that last part. You you live it moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you well, live you live life forward. Uh -huh. Right. You live life forward. Yeah. That's where it moves forward. Exactly. But you understand, you understand it looking it. back. Looking back. We we have terrible memories, mm -hmm. right? And so it's important that we look back and, and understand all that we've been through because We've overcome a whole lot. I bet you if you look at your own life and you look oh, yeah. at the twists and turns and the valley moments, you, when you look back, you're like, man, I accomplished that. Yeah. But in the moment, when you're going through hard stuff, it's hard. Yeah. So, yeah, you you, you live life forward, but you understand it you as you reflect back. and look back. Yeah. What I like about that about that saying, the concept, right? You, you, I'm, I might mess it up again, but you, you live life forward and you understand it looking backwards, right? What I understand about that, your experience at Cincinnati, my experience at Michigan State, is that we, there are there are probably multiple experiences that we've had throughout our careers like that. And so what I wonder from you is, what other lessons have you learned, you know what I mean, from the experiences that we've had like that? Because it, it would be silly for us to rehash all the experience, but you probably can remember some of the lessons from those types of experiences. Well, I, I think many times we're, we're talking about organizational leadership, mm -hmm. right? But one of the things I've learned is that we should be talking about who we are, okay. the full person that we are, right? The full The full version of who we are. And I think sometimes we say so focused on what are we learning through leadership in our workplace. There are so many things that I've learned as a husband, as a father, and and really helping my my kids or going through some things with my family that I've had to lead. I've had to be vulnerable. I've had to say I'm sorry. Um, there, there are things that we learn in serving a group. And so I, I would say in many ways, the, the most challenging position for me, you can look at my resume, but the most challenging role for me has been my leadership role in my home with and my I, boys. Yeah. Because, you know, I don't have a manual for that. It's a trial and error and you try to figure out. And in and, and many ways, um, you know, they're seeing the fullness of you, right? They see all parts of you. And so what I've tried to do, Ty, um, from from that is to to live imperfectly in front of my boys. Uh, when I when I make a mistake, I I tell them I apologize. I ask for their forgiveness because I'm trying to teach them always. We're going to make mistakes, but there's always another move on the board. Yeah. And so I want to model the example. I don't want to model the example of a perfect person because mm -hmm. they're not going to walk through life perfectly, right. not making mistakes. Yeah. I want to show them the scars, but teach them this is what you do when you encounter yeah. things, when you make mistakes. Yeah, I think that's excellent live imperfectly yeah. in front of the family, right? Yeah. yeah, I think that's excellent. You talked before about you have had to hire people into leadership positions. Right? You mentioned that. And I imagine because student development and performance are in your title, the positions has something to do with one of those two. Tell me about that, that aspect and what did that experience, let me see how I can ask this question. What buttons did that experience press, <laughs> right, <laughs> in the Raymond Harrison? Playbook? So this this is a situation where we're we're looking back, yeah, right? Exactly. We live life forward, mm -hmm. and uh, 
there, there's a point in time where we were starting a an academic year and we were down two critical leadership positions, okay. one in nutrition, two in nutrition, and then one in sports medicine, okay. the lead sports medicine uh, associate AD. Wow. And so um, it was invigorating because now the, it, I was up against it, yeah. right? We've got to find someone gotta, gotta and this is not the ideal time. And but and you don't make it, are critical. But you don't you don't make excuses. You you do you you, you do a national search. Mm -hmm. You you make sure that we're we're doing it where we're having a very diverse candidate pool. Um, it doesn't change our process just right. because we've got to get somebody in at, in a shorter period of time. But that process, when you find the right people, Ty, when you run a process that yield the right people who align with your values, mm -hmm. it's invigorating. And so it's just energized me because it's that's it, part of the com competition side of us, yeah. right? We we want to be able to do some things that people don't think we can do to show them. Um, and so bringing in and hiring those really critical positions, and then bringing them on and allowing them to now hire according to that same value system of aligning our values, and then just pulling that team together. So I lead what we call our PAC performance team. Okay. And so that's, you know, the academic piece. I don't oversee academics, but it's part of it. It's academic, student athlete, leadership, engagement, mm -hmm. everything. Um, sports medicine, strength and condition, nutrition, sports psych. But now what's really cool is we're getting those leaders on the same page. Mm -hmm. And so you're hiring people, but now you're trying to create these, these, um, you're creating these opportunities for them to have real conversation, authentic conversation, and sometimes healthy conflict because yeah. that's how you build it. Yeah. And and it's been just an awesome experience. And we've had a phenomenal year. And I keep telling people, yes, it's phenomenal because of what's been done in this year. But a lot of that was due to the seeds that were planted previously. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100%. And so, so these people you've hired – like you said, right? They already had the values, so you hired values, and I imagine they they buy into that concept too, in terms of the teams they put together for what they they've had to do. Talk to me a little bit about like that process of bringing somebody on, and and is there a is there a light that goes off when you realize, okay, yeah, they they get who we are, and they're, and they're going to fit in well, like because it's I don't it's usually not immediate, right? Well, it, it, it's a couple of processes yeah. when that happens. Um, I think it, for me, I, I see it in the interview process. Oh, really? Um, okay. I, I see part of it there. I don't see all of it. I see a part of the light there. Um, but then I see it through when it gets through the rough spots when they get here because everybody's got a honeymoon period and everybody's going to be on their best behaviors. But when we get people comfortable and and they're actually and their their staffs are really comfortable and now everybody stops positioning themselves and become who they really are um it's in those moments where you see how are they going to handle some of the adversity how are they going to now um have a correction with one of the staff members how are they actually doing that or are there situations where they're coming and they're asking can you help me with this that's a that's me that's a raise your hand type of core value and, and I love that because one of the things is we don't always have to be the smartest people in the room and we don't always have to have the answers. We just need to know the, who to go to and how can we trust each other? How can we position ourselves so we can talk to each other to not always make decisions in a vacuum? Yeah. I asked this last question, then we'll wrap up. I've, I've asked this to people in the athletics director chair over the last couple of years. And I want to start asking to people who aren't in the athletic director chair. At some point, you go and become the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, right? When you look back at, right, when you when you understand back at your time at North Carolina State, what would, A, the athletic director, and B, what would you say the legacy you left was? How did you leave it better than you found it? What I would say, and, and hopefully other people, mm -hmm. um, I, when I went there, I knew when you when you take a new job, uh, there's a process where you've got to you got to go slow. Um, you can't move fast because you don't know much. You don't understand the you don't understand the historical. You don't have the historical knowledge. You don't understand the climate. You don't know why some of the decisions have been made to put some processes in place. So you have to take your time. 
So one of the things, Todd, for me was I just was committed to handle what I could handle, okay. which was I wanted to plant seeds every day. Yep. And what that meant for me is I wanted to show up consistently every day, no matter what was going on, you were going to get the same me every day. I think it's vital in leadership. Um, I think you have to be consistent. I think you have to be steady. It doesn't mean that you have to be perfect or that you have to be unemotional, but I want to make sure that I'm showing up for people every day because I don't want to put people in an environment where they're wondering how is he going to respond today or this day? Yeah, because right. if I'm creating that type of environment, everything is going to flow downhill. Yep. And so I've got direct reports who largely oversee um, 70 plus of our staff. And so I've got to be able to model, not only am I treating them right, but I'm also modeling hopefully the example and you can see people seeing that, um, practicing that throughout the organization. So my hope is that uh, Raymond Harrison came and uh, planted some seeds that over time yielded some fruit. Through consistency. Through consistency. So, so. And caring about people. Exactly. So when they look back, they'll say, you know, he was very consistent. And I see the people that work with him who, who have taken on that, that mantra of consistency and caring for people. I hope so, Ty, because that's what it's all about, man. It's, we're, we're here to serve. We're here to serve people. Yeah. We're here to serve our student athletes first and foremost, but we have to serve the ones that touch them the most. Yes, sir. Right. We got to help them put their oxygen mask on because if they don't have theirs on, then that's going to flow downhill to our students. Right, yeah, I think that's excellent. Well, Raymond, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate you joining us here on the One Question Leadership Podcast. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate you having me, sir. Yes, sir. That was Raymond Harrison, Senior Associate Athletics Director for Student Development and Performance at North Carolina State. And of course, I am Ty Brown with one question. And keep in mind, the role of a leader is to create and maintain an environment that people want to be a part of. And as always, be better tomorrow than you are today. This episode of the One Question Leadership Podcast is produced by Spades Media Group, solving problems using creative leadership.